it feels like something is breaking loose in the conversation, in the visibility of the conversation around lab leak hypothesis. Does it not? Um, in service of that, I would say, uh, hey, Zach, you can show our screen here for the moment. This is in The Telegraph today, uh, which is a um, British paper. Did the COVID-19 virus really escape from a Wuhan lab? Fingers have been pointed at bats, pangolins, and a shuttered wet market, but what if the truth is altogether more alarming? This um, published today by Matt Ridley and Alina Chan, Alina Chan being one of the scientists who has been tirelessly working on trying to figure this out. Uh, and... Um, and there was also a piece, an editorial, I think, in WAPO and Washington Post this week. Yep. And um, uh, yeah, there there have been three. I think there was an, another one, but I've forgotten which publication it was in. Um, but anyway, yes, something is clearly breaking loose. Mm -hmm. um, and I think th this has multiple levels of relevance because on the one hand, there's the question, and I was very pleased to see um, Matt and Alina address this in terms of the answer to where this virus came from is, I think they say it's uh, maybe the most important question of the century. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree with them. I don't think we fully understand what we will be able to derive from the answer to that. But I know full well there will be important aspects once we know, whatever the answer is. If it's a natural origin, we need to know that because for one thing, if it's a natural origin, it's a very bizarre natural origin. It doesn't fit any of the others that we know about. And so we will learn something about what is possible that is very important. On the other hand... Well, it the, the originally proposed hypothesis, which was presented as fact, and you can't question it, right, for yeah. SARS-CoV-2 was originated in a bat, ended up in the wet market through smuggled pangolins. Yes. It, which is you know, clear. There's just, there's just no evidence for this at this point, practically, or there's a lot of evidence against. Yes. But the origin story that um, is the mainstream origin story for SARS-CoV-1 is parallel to that. And so, like, you know, it, it seems, it seems like a reasonable thing to have thought at first, assuming that all of this is organic and these are good faith players, that SARS-CoV-1 was originally in a horseshoe bat and then showed up in a market in, um, in a secondary, you know, having, having spilled over into a secondary host in, um, what, some kind of carnivorin. Uh, palm civet. Palm civet. Yeah. Palm civet. So this was a wet market situation. Right. Um, but it still doesn't match. Okay, so I must say there are questions the, about the, the original. So SARS-CoV-1 and and the proposal on SARS-CoV-2 mm -hmm. do not match the evidence. There's something new going on here because in SARS-CoV-1 you did have rapid evolution of this pathogen in humans. That's one thing that you would absolutely. I don't want to say. It's required because mm -hmm. I could imagine, you know, in the way that birds and people or pigs and people exchange certain viruses back and forth, it's possible that you're part of a long-standing system and therefore the evolution has already taken place at the point something uh, crosses over. But in this case, that's not what appears to be going on. And so the idea of a virus that is well adapted to humans to, to begin with and therefore takes off like a shot is unique and unlike SARS-CoV-1. Right. So just just to be clear about what you're saying, because I think there are a lot of sort of dangling modifiers in there. Um, this is the second trick to which you have referred, both on Bill Maher and many times on 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 here, and maybe even in jo Joe Rogan when you were on on Rogan last June. Um, the you know the the one trick is of uh, zoonotic diseases is switching hosts, and there you know there are a lot of additional tricks. But the other major trick that we saw with SARS-CoV-2 is well, that we see with anything that becomes pandemic. Um, is then being able to rapidly spread between humans, between individuals, between conspecifics of the species of the new host into which it is spilled over. And um, that will almost always take time to evolve. That capability in the pathogen will take time to evolve. And what was so notable about SARS-CoV-2 is that it was it had both tricks on board as soon as we started hearing about it. Or there's something that we've missed. Or there's something that we've missed, sure. Um, okay, go on. So A, there's the speed. B, there's the evidence it would leave in the phylogeny. Right, so if you do the phylogeny, you would have diversity that we don't see here in the initial thing. So it's possible there's some phase of the story we just don't know. If this is mm -hmm. a natural origin story, you know, the, the thing that gets said is it could have circulated somewhere else 
that we still haven't detected. And mm -hmm. then, you know, somebody takes a train and they end up in Wuhan and we notice it and it's already adapted because it's been uh, circulating and evolving. Um, but the point is, okay, there's been an awful lot of pressure to find evidence of that. There is no evidence of that yet. Mm -hmm. And so what we are left with is an, is an anomaly one way or the other. And the answer to that anomaly is vitally important to figuring out what to do. Mm -hmm. um, and people have not, uh, Alina and Matt were very good about pointing out that it's there, though they don't say what the value is. Um, but um, there's that. And then there's the other question, which is more obvious, which is if this is a lab leak, even if it didn't do anything for us with respect to uh, preparing and fighting uh, COVID going forward, it would do something for the next pandemic, which we are likely to cause by the same route. Mm -hmm. if, if lab leak, it is likely to have been uh, at least partially a result of the gain of function and research that involves serial passaging. And if that research continues... Um, lab leaks are likely to continue to happen down the road. Right. And in fact, one of the things that shows up in a lot of the good reporting on this is that there is a long catalog of accidents where things have leaked out of labs. Right. This is unprecedented in one regard, and in another way, it's completely mundane. Um, you know, that nothing about COVID is mundane, but the fact yeah. of something having leaked out of a lab would be anything but new. Yeah. And I guess, I mean, just one more important distinction between SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 is precisely that SARS-CoV-1 did not become a global pandemic. It precisely lacked being very good at that second trick. It was able to move between humans, but not super fast and not nearly as effectively as SARS-CoV-2 seemed to come out of the starting gates being right. able to do. So it burned out, which is another yep. uh, typical thing. So, you know, for, from- It's a typical thing for a natural zoonotic spillover event. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Um, so, but to the second point, I, I don't want to take too much time here, but mm -hmm. there's two issues happening in parallel. One is what the hell is COVID and why does it behave the way it does and where did it come from? Super important. COVID or SARS-CoV-2? The disease or the pathogen? I was calling it COVID just because the, you know, the pandemic, the, the impact on people is okay. the important thing, mm -hmm. but obviously the causal agent is, you know, okay. is where the evidence lives. But- Totally separately from that, mm -hmm. this story, as you point out, something new is breaking loose. This is a very rare example of the, uh, the gated institutional narrative not having effectively silenced some uncomfortable, awful possibility that needs to be investigated. And so that exceptional fact what it is that allowed this discussion to actually move in the direction of something reasonable. And although those of us who believe lab leak uh, is a possibility differ, I believe, widely on how likely we think it is. Um, it's also worth noting, though, that in Ridley and Chan's uh, piece in The Telegraph today, they finish by listing a whole number of virologists uh, and epidemiologists who in the early days were saying very, very absolute things about uh, this it not being a possibility. And um, in fact, I believe, I did not actually go back and check to make sure this is true, but that like 27 authored paper that was published in, I think, Nature early in the pandemic saying there's no way this is a natural zoonotic spillover, there's no way this is a lab leak, um, ha are now, when asked by Chan or Ridley, and, and um, they say, and are willing to go on the record saying, well, yes, it's a possibility. Yep. And so we are seeing, we are also seeing a move on the part of the scientists, some of whom were involved in participating in silencing this and silencing actual scientific inquiry in the first place. Yeah, we, so, you know, you know g great that we are actually, that people are actually now saying, yes, it's a possibility, but I would really not, I would really not want to lose the history here. Yeah. That, that those people who have been involved, and you know, it, it persists. You know, we're still being called conspiracy theorists and anti-scientific for questioning what the authorities have already declared is true and stamped it on everyone's foreheads. Um, like that, that is still alive and well, and it's still dominant. But sort of slowly behind the scenes, you're beginning to see movement 
by the actual scientists who never should have come out as certain as they did in the first place. That was a big part of the problem. Yeah, it wasn't certain then, and there was a uh, rush to circle the wagons around that certainty, which caused, I think, a lot of people who were paying slightly less attention to believe it actually was certain, which well, made it very difficult to... I mean, yeah, as, as I said on Mars, as I've said here, you know, because, because the possibility of a lab leak came out of Trump's mouth... You know, half the country immediately said, no way, no how. And, you know, and the media facilitated that. Mainstream media said, oh, if he said it, you know, Orange Man says it, it must not be true. Guess what, guys? That's not only not the way science works, it's not the way reality works. It doesn't matter who says it. If it's true, it's true. Yeah. And, you know, this story is one, as with all of these stories, the nuanced position that follows the evidence and extrapolates responsibly from it lands on a slate of conclusions that doesn't belong in some camp, right? Mm -hmm. You know, is there a possibility of a lab leak here? Yes, the evidence so far points in that direction and not the other direction, but not conclusively. On the other hand, does that mean that this is a Chinese virus? No, there's an awful lot of evidence pointing to the fact of an international failure of the proper safety. It's an international collaboration virus. Yes, an international collaboration virus. Yeah. And so the point is, you know, this isn't going to play for one team or the other. And you've, you know, you've been fed two possibilities, and but they're both wrong. Certainly. Mm -hmm. And the the right thing is going to involve having to parse these details. But OK, yeah, I, actually, no, I actually want to muddle this a little bit more politically for people, because I think I think that actually will help people lose their. But I'm on the blue team, therefore, I believe this. I'm on the red team, therefore, I believe this stuff, uh, which is that uh, gain of function research has been contentious in the scientific community since it began. And it became um, it. it it rose to the top of people's concern sufficiently that in, I think it was 2000, I can't remember, 2014 or 2015, that is during the Obama administration, um, there was a, a moratorium at the federal level in the United States put on gain of function research in the US. That stopped then. Now that actually probably facilitated some of this collaboration that then moved it off offshore, which I, we're not going to go there right now. But um, that moratorium that uh, the Obama administration put on exactly this gain of function research was in fact lifted by the Trump administration at the end of his first year in, in twenty at the end of twenty seventeen. And so, which team are you playing for now? Like, how how does that stuff make you feel about who the good guys are and who the bad guys are? Guess what? Again, reality doesn't care what you think or the politics of the people involved or whether or not they're right or wrong about other stuff. You know, this virus has an origin and we don't know what it is yet. But, you know, a year ago, we were already, you know, as you say, the wagons were already being circled on there is only one story that we are going to talk about, says the scientific community. We are scientists. We are in the scientific community. And we never wanted to be part of a situation which says, ah, you don't need to know the evidence, but we've already decided what the truth is. Nope, not science. And if going forward, you want this never to happen again, you need to empower people to actually um, deal with the a la carte conclusions rather than signing up for a slate and a team, right? The whole, yes. the whole point yep. is that this is not a clear story. This is a screw up at multiple levels. We know that it's a screw up at multiple levels, even if it is natural origin, right? Yep. The fact is we suddenly yes. are all aware that these viruses are being enhanced in laboratories. This is an obvious hazard, whether or not it actually spilled over from the lab this time. Um, but you absolutely have to have a free scientific discussion that then is allowed to impact policy without polarizing this because the polarization is going to have played a huge role. If this is a lab leak, it's going to have played a huge role in this, the mother of all self-inflicted wounds. 